Hi, everybody. Welcome. It is so nice to get to meet you all digitally in this space. Not see everybody, but that's okay. I am Allison Rowe. I just recently moved to Iowa. So this is a really special day for me because I get to join all of you in celebrating the awards that you have won and applied for, or for those of you that are teachers celebrating with your students all their accomplishments. So it's a really exciting day. And I get to learn some more about some people who are here in our state in the Midwest um, making art. So I'm just gonna give a brief introduction of a couple sentences to each of our amazing panelists that's gonna be sharing some of their work with us today. And then we will jump straight into looking at their artwork because I know that's probably what you're most excited to do. So we have two people with us. Um, we have Talasa Rash, who is a French American artist, educator, and beekeeper based in Iowa and Maine, as well as an assistant professor of photography and experimental media here at the University of Iowa. And we also have Monica Correa, who is a professor and the head of the 3D design program at the University of Iowa in the School of Art and Art History. So with Without further ado, maybe we can uh, jump into looking at Talasa's work. Sure, let me get my screen going here. I'm so excited to be with you all today. Um, is that working? Are you seeing a full slide and not presenter notes or anything like that? Okay, good. Um, first, I just wanna give a warm welcome and congratulations to all the students who participated in the Scholastic Awards this year. Um, like Professor Rowe, I'm actually new to Iowa and I have participated as a scholastic juror in the past um, in Maine where I was living before. And so this is like a really lovely familiar process for me to, to jump into in Iowa. And I really enjoyed seeing all the student work um, and getting to kind of have that be my introduction to the arts in Iowa. It's been really, really lovely. I'm raising a celebratory cup of tea. I don't know if you can see it um, your way. Um, in to celebrate you today. And I hope you're celebrating on your end with your family and friends. Um, I'm gonna speak briefly about my work today. Um, as Professor Rowe said, I'm, um, oops, let me see if I can advance the slides. Um, I'm an artist. So this is one of my pieces installed in Charleston. Um, uh, I'm also a curator. So I really enjoy looking at other artists' work and finding ways to collaborate and put those together in spaces. Most recently, this is a, a photography show that I curated in the Visual Arts Building, which is the building on my background at the University of Iowa. Um, this actually just came down yesterday. It was really exciting and it featured um, primarily student, student work. So that was really special. Um, and then of course, I'm also a teacher. Um, and for me, getting to work with students is really deeply inspiring. Um, and as part of this ongoing dialogue, um, getting to keep in touch with my students and see how they progress over the years has always been really special and continues to inform my practice and my process. Um, today, I'm really just gonna focus on one project. It's hard to, to kind of cover a lot of ground in 10 minutes. I've actually tried to truncate something that's only um, 40 minutes into a 10 minute talk here. So bear with me um, and feel free to ask any questions if you feel like I didn't cover everything. This project is titled In Over My Head. It's a pretty large project, um, uh, mainly documentary and it's focused in that it um, is about a grave digger uh, in, in uh, rural Northeastern Maine. Uh, this is him here with his golden retriever, Sadie, um, and his name is Everard Hall. He's one of the last grave diggers that's still hand digging and filling graves by hand. Um, so for me, I, there's, there's layers of my interest in him and story and my collaboration with him, but I also really felt like there was this tradition that was going to fade with him. So when he retires, when he hangs up his shovels, there will be no, no one left to continue this manual craft. Instead, um, it will be a backhoe that continues the labor and the work. And I really felt like there was something being lost there in this process of grieving, um, especially in a smaller community where he knows everybody, um, he knows and has personal connections with the people that he's burying. Um, and people are really comfortable with him and his presence um, in the grocery store. When I would spend time with him, we always had people coming up to us um, asking about how he was going to dig their grave and, 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 you know, basically getting a promise out of him that he would do that work for them. So as you can see, I've, of course, made photographs with him. 
Um, but I'm an interdisciplinary artist. So I've also collected audio and video. Um, I'm actually working on the video project right now um, to this installation. There's archival materials. So he's photographed his own labor over the years and that's become part of the project as well. I just received a grant um, through the Oberman Center at the University of Iowa to finish the manuscript of the book that I'm working on that incorporates his archival images in conversation with my work. Um, you can see some of the various exhibitions that have taken place over the years. Um, I, I should note that this is uh, a project that I started in about 2015, and Everard is still someone that I go to visit every year. Um, there's been a few summers where I've actually lived with him um, and his wife and dug graves with him. And that sort of immersive experience, especially for working on a project like this, was very important to me. Um, the photographs for the photo nerds in the audience are a mix, uh, mostly actually four by five uh, large format photographs, but then also some medium format and every once in a while a digital photograph as well. Here you can see an installation that I did in, um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, and you'll see the headphones there. There's an audio component to this piece that I call an audio landscape. Um, that's really meant to bring you into the immersive space of, of Everard, of his world, and then also a little bit more about our relationship. The relationship isn't as evident in the photographs themselves, but it's an important part of the story. And I decided to really like steer away from trying to hide my presence in the work and be a little bit more overt about why I was there, why I was making this work. Everard was someone that I met um, when I first lived in Maine and we became friends. But over the years, I've experienced my own very personal losses and grief. And I sort of turned to him as a guide of how to live more comfortably with death and dying, and also as a space to sort of grieve more comfortably. I found it really hard to kind of go about my daily life as if everything was normal. Um, and ever became kind of, I, I think of him as this mythic figure, really, as a sort of ferryman on the river Styx, who, who has this knowledge, who has this ability to live every day of his life, um, uh, close to death and dying, honoring death and dying in a really special and careful way. Um, and I look to him to learn. Let's see how I'm doing on time. Don't want to go too long here. Um, He's also, I think of him as a, as a self-taught artist. I'll skip ahead actually. I feel like I don't want, I want to get through everything here. So I think of him as a self-taught artist and, I, and I've spoken to him about that, both in the care and sort of sculptural forms of the grave digging. But I also um, feel like he comes from this lineage and this tradition that has craft at the heart of it. And so this project has brought me to a lot of really cool things. I got a grant to go to Rome and do some research where I tracked down the first visual representation of a grave digger that I was able to find. This is in the catacombs of Domitilla outside of Rome. You can see that the fresco is actually really badly damaged, ironically, by the man who was trying to preserve it. But luckily, he made this drawing on the left um, of, uh, of Diogenes, the fossor or grave digger at the time who was managing the catacombs. And then this was actually a portrait that I made of Everard on the right long before I had seen this fresco or that I knew it existed. And so there's this strange echo of these two grave diggers on their lunch break, maybe, um, in the cemetery. This is also another uh, grave uh, or rubbing that I made in the catacombs, another depiction of a grave digger with their pickaxe. You can see that research is also at the heart of my practice and understanding the context for making this work and how it is situated in a larger art history is really important to me. Um, this is some of that archival material that I mentioned, and I will wrap up in just a few minutes here, but um, this is where I'm at now, is I have all this archival material, I have the photographs, which are pretty much done, but trying to figure out how they all exist together in an installation space, but also now a book. So um, these are images, these are spreads from the book that I'm working on now that recreate his archives. Um, and uh, hopefully with the hope of sharing that with a larger audience. And you can see here the way in which um, the labor of his day-to-day -day life is really up against um, you know, birthday parties, his daughter's first day of school. There's this comfort and this overlap that I think is pretty um, unique and, and arresting. I've never seen an archive like this. That's his daughter on her first day of school.
And I could talk about this forever, but I'm just gonna leave this here. Um, I do a lot of other photographic work um, and audio work at the, at the moment is kind of what I'm focusing on. I'm working in a really different way these days. I'm constructing photographs to then, um, to then image and, and make into prints. Um, so I'm working in a much less documentary fashion. Um, and I wanted to leave this quote here, this idea that surrealism lies at the heart of the photographic enterprise in the very creation of a duplicate world, of reality in the second degree, narrower but more dramatic than the one perceived by natural vision. And I think about that with the grave digger too, that even though it represents him in his daily life, I really think that in a way what I'm constructing is a fiction. It's a it's a sort of alternate world and a storyline, a myth-making really that I'm trying to construct through my images and my work. Um, I will leave it there for now. Um, feel free to keep in touch and I'm looking forward to answering some of your questions as well. Thank you so much for that exciting presentation. I feel like I already have a million questions mm -hmm. and things I wanna talk about. Um, but actually, I think first we're going to hold on to our questions as much as we can, and we're going to pass it off to Monica, who has a really different kind of a practice. So we're going to have a really interesting conversation here today and get to look at some different kinds of work. Uh, can I start, Allison? Yeah, go uh, ahead. Thank Melissa, you. Melissa, can you stop sharing? Uh, just give me a second here because now I'm getting prepared to share. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Monica Correa. Um, uh, I want to congratulate you all for all the awards and the hard work. Uh, I was part of the jury and was a pleasure to see all the work you, so many students made, and it's exciting to see this young generation uh, with new ideas. And, and uh, you know, we are here, and uh, we anyone joining Universal Viva, we will be very happy to meet you if you want to say hi, or even those that are not necessarily coming to the Universal Viva, if you want to say hi, that will be awesome. Congratulations! We are very happy you're here, and thanks for attending this event. So. Anyway, uh, I like to start by uh, explaining that, that I'm Brazilian and putting that in context. Uh, so as you can see here, the heart is Iowa and the arrow is Rio de Janeiro, where I'm from. Uh, so uh, my work, uh, I'm a designer. I'm also an architect. So I worked in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro for 12 years. I was born and raised in Brazil. Uh, in Rio, uh, and uh, I did a lot of commercial uh, design, uh, and then I end up in Iowa. I don't have time to talk about that. It's a long story, uh, and I love uh, where I am and where I am at. So, uh, so this the, the images is just to provide some background from where my ideas come from. So I grew up in a just a outstanding, beautiful city. Uh, surrounded by the ocean and uh, a lot of uh, landscape that is was like really impactful. Um, uh, my my school, uh, my university, every place. All my you know, you go for a walk, it's green all over the place. Or beaches, it's just beautiful. So my work is impacted by my uh, environment, uh, and uh, I wanna. I had a hard time. Uh, picking uh, uh, concepts to talk in 10 minutes. This is probably the shortest presentation I ever made of my work. So I selected four pieces to kind of highlight the different things that I do uh, nowadays. So one is furniture. And uh, this piece that you're looking at is a, is a stool. Uh, and uh, was my work is very abstracted from the nature that I see. So one of the things that I used to do a lot when I was in Rio was to visit the botanical garden, which is uh, the, this, uh, you know, this alley of trees that you see on the left top. So uh, visiting that place, there's a lot of flowers, plants, and etc. So in this design, I, I try to abstract uh, uh, the image of a stamp. Uh, 
like growth. And um, I did this with computer technology. It was all designed in the, in the modeling software. And uh, then the, uh, it was milled with a, a, a machine that was operated by a computer and uh, in, in a few pieces of foam that were assembled and finished with fiberglass and a coat of uh, 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 automotive paint. Um, here you see a picture of me sitting in the stool just to give you an idea of scale. And I have to, the other thing about this project that I, I, I was really interesting uh, was that uh, I had to figure out the design by testing really small scale prototypes that were 3D printed. And this was a really expensive piece uh, back in the days when this was made uh, a few years ago. Uh, and uh, I could not make a mistake in the design. So, because if it were, I was making a mistake when the piece was coming back to me, this was actually made in Texas, um, there would not be a way to fix the mistake. So was really challenging in the sense of having the responsibility of that budget and not making a mistake. It was really an awesome and very uh, uh, exciting experience. And I was very pleased with the outcome. Um, so the other piece I wanna share with you guys is a, a, a series of lamps, like pictures that I made, that they are inspired by the firefly. And um, there is also this amazing spot in Rio uh, where I have an image here that you see the sun going down. Uh, it's called Arpoador. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really outstanding, uh, the colors. And it, it's such a unique experience as a place. Any, anyone that goes to Rio de Janeiro should visit. So the connection between that mood of that light that was something I was trying to accomplish. And the fact that the, the firefly uh, has a very interesting body structure where the, the light is at the bottom, uh, inspired this set of uh, uh, light pictures that I kind of got the design of the, the, the outline of the, the firefly on the piece, and I moved the light source to the very bottom. So when you can see on the picture on the left, actually, this piece assembles, uh, disassembles and assembles all a flat inside the package, as you can see in the bot bottom left image. Uh, it, but I also want to highlight that if, if, I don't know if you can see through the slides because each one has a different screen, very hard to conceive light through technology that we are using. Uh, but uh, is that warmth? that uh, is present in the sun going down that it's in the, these pieces. Uh, and then uh, the, these evolved into uh, switching to uh, moving to the top, but always in, in a different uh, place. So th these uh, were uh, to be hanging fixtures while these were like standing fixtures. Uh, the other piece that I wanna highlight it's something related to nature. Um, I, uh, you know, many years of uh, uh, watching my family uh, working with different kinds of craft and lace, uh, my, my mother, my grandmother, so that kind of uh, experience. Uh, and in addition to that, all the details in religious Catholic uh, architecture in, in Rio de Janeiro that is unbelievable, uh, present in many sculptural pieces and also architecture features um, were the inspiration for a, a, a secondary, I won't say secondary, another, another branch of my work, uh, which is, uh, you can see this in this installation where through a really large, this was a faculty exhibition we had at the Figi Art Museum uh, a few years ago. Uh, normally, on a normal schedule, we have exhibitions biannually. Uh, so I had the opportunity to come up with something, and I said I want to do an installation that can conceive the concept of lace, uh, but in a much larger scale uh, and filtering light through these pieces. I'm uh, very interested in how light uh, impacts uh, our perception uh, as well. Um, 
So another piece that uh, highlights the, the, this inspiration that I have with uh, uh, lace, you can see is a set of tables here that were all uh, done with computer uh, uh, software, all the planning for the designs and they were uh, kind of milled from the top and uh, uh, through like a, a natural resin, I applied the resin on the top and they have like a, a different colors. And what I was trying to create with the, these tables and a candle holder set uh, was the idea of gathering people that can sit uh, on like low seating close to the floor uh, and have it can use the bottom of the, see there are two surfaces, the usual table surface and there is also a surface near the floor. So the, the surface near the floor is if you're sitting really close on a pillow close to the floor, you can use that for your glasses. Uh, so, and use the tables for snacks and get, making people gather around. So uh, I, I like to provoke some kind of questions with my work. It's like, uh, why did you do this? Why this is big or why are you, there's always something unique. I think the research, and that's uh, something very nice about uh, the University of Iowa, is the, the idea of uh, uh, looking for concepts that are new, uh, unexpected. Uh, and this is what I teach. I'm also a teacher as, as Allison introduced me. I'm the head of the 3D design program uh, and many other things that it's a list of things that I do. But uh, uh, yeah, that's research is trying something different. Uh, so if you have questions for me, uh, here's my email. Uh, uh, and also my website, Monica Correa at uiwa.edu and um, monicacorrea.com is my website. There's some few more pieces there. Uh, and I'm, you know, any questions, I will be so happy to answer. Thanks for listening. Thank you both. Uh, thank you, Monica. Oh, my apologies. Sorry, that was the timer I set for myself. So I made sure that I I kept us on track here in my job as the moderator. Um, thank you both for those wonderful presentations. I know that some of you probably have questions, so feel free to start popping any questions that you have here into the chat, and I will be happy to mix them into our conversation. But I thought I might start out here by asking about um, Talasa and Monica, how you came to the mediums that you work with today. I think for lots of young artists, when they're thinking of art making, sometimes they think maybe just of drawing or painting. And you're talking about working in design and installation and collaborative interdisciplinary photographic projects, all these really different things. So I was wondering, did you start out right away thinking you were interested in design or photography? Or was there um, a journey over the time, even from when you were a, a young maker, maybe a child or when you were in high school as well? Uh, do you wanna go first, Alessa? Sure, yeah. Um... I was always drawn to creative fields um, and really enjoyed that kind of work. A lot of my family, especially on my mother's side, are craft people. Um, and so I had this kind of like attention to making in my life. Um, but I, I think, and this is what I would recommend for a lot of folks, is I tried a lot of things. So I think when I was in a high, high school, I, was, I never took a photography class. I was painting. I was drawing. I was trying sculpture. I wasn't very good at sculpture. I was trying to make sculptures. And then when I went to college, same thing. I kept trying things. I actually thought I was going to pursue architecture, that that was the best balance of my interest in creative pursuits, but a professional practice. Um, but I took video classes along the way. And I actually had a, a video teacher who said, you know, you make videos like you're a photographer. And at the time, I really resented that. I really, I'm, I'm a video maker. How, why would they say that to me and but it kind of percolated and after my undergraduate career I took a photography class and I you know I also think of like really amazing mentors that I had along the way and that makes a huge difference um, your teachers your high school teachers your college professors are you know happy to be in your lives and helping you out and so kind of keeping those conversations going even after you graduate your teachers will always be happy to hear from you and they can kind of continue to help and guide you um, and shepherd you along. And so I kind of landed within photography in this meandering path. Um, 
But I think that's also where my appreciation of these other mediums comes from and being able to collaborate and incorporate audio or video, depending on the project, um, that those experiences have only enriched what I can do today, I think. Um, for me, uh, was I think since I, I was little, as, as far as I can uh, remember, uh, I always liked to build the structures with, as a child with blankets and uh, bed sheets, hanging them and creating uh, rooms. Uh, spaces to hide and play uh, and also drawing. I always li liked drawing and I was always interested in trying things. Uh, I remember and when I was in high school, I did a, so many different things. But when I applied first for architecture, I had no doubt that that was the, the, my right thing. And uh, I, I, you know, I don't practice nowadays because a person can't do everything. I also have a a uh, Master of Fine Arts degree from University of Iowa uh, in art. So uh, I, it's just the, 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 the necessity that I have is some personal thing of trying things. And I like to design things that people make things that people uh, have pleasure with uh, to create something that will benefit them. Uh, make them feel uh, relaxed, uh, bring some uh, beauty into their lives. Uh, the world is sometimes is really complicated. And I think uh, my job as a designer is to enhance in, in whatever way I can. So the, the, when I begin making something or designing something, uh, this, what I'm doing is in, usually impacted by some kind of experience or something I saw, which relates to the environment. And then the, the choice for materials and uh, everything comes along with the, I, I, how am I going to convey uh, what I wanna do? And, and design embraces all many, many, many disciplines. So it, it's complex, but at the same time is so fun. Uh, I think if one thing I tell students is if you're in love with what you do, it's going to be good. Great. Well, thank you. That um, both of those insights were really helpful for me in thinking more about how you've ended up in your practices that you're in now. And it sounds like for both of you, it's been a journey that changes over time. So I think that's helpful for all of us as artists, young artists, no matter what age artists you are, to think about how that shifts over time. And I think I heard you both mention some pretty interesting things about audience and how um, connecting with other people or having other people look at your work were an are an important part of um, of what you do. And I was wondering if that um, for each of you, if the audience and the end and sharing your work is that one of your favorite parts of making a project, or is there something else that's your favorite part of art making? Is it the idea phase or the physical creation phase? What's the part of the process that's the most enjoyable for you? Go first, Alexa. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, I think that there are waves for me. So I love making the work. It's kind of like what Monica was saying is that if you love what you do, it's going to be, it's always going to be fun and interesting. I think part of what attracts me to being an artist too is there's a lot of curiosity and problem solving and asking questions and that never ends. And so to me, that's really exciting. I'm always in this process of learning. Um, which I love. So I, I really like making the work because that's part of that process is you're trying something and it doesn't always work. Okay. So failure, or I wouldn't call it failure. It's like good mistakes are always a part of art making, right? And you kind of, the ability to have that happen and then keep moving, you learn from it, you try something different, you don't let it defeat you. Um, that part of the process is really fun for me. Uh, I, I just like finishing projects. I, you know, just, there's like a lot of emails, a lot of like, you know, applying for shows, it ends up being really administrative, which is not the fun part, but it's super important. So I would say it's good as a young artist to know that that's an equally important part of it, that as a creator, you're, you're kind of an entrepreneur, you're there to advocate for yourself and also think creatively about how your work can exist in the world and why other people should care about it. You're kind of constantly um, advocating for what you do and why it's interesting. Um, 
And then I think my other favorite part would be sharing it. Of course, it's like you spend so long, you know, being an artist can be kind of solitary. You're, you're thinking about this thing for so long that it's really nice to open it back up again um, and, and notice that other people are interested, that they have their own questions and responses. It kind of reminds me that what I'm doing is not just interesting to me, but hopefully it's interesting to a wider audience. And then, you know, they get to take that information and do other things with it, or it invites collaborations, conversations. So, yeah, I think I have these, like, two, my two favorite parts are the start and the very end. <laughs> it's the in-between busy work that's, that's not as fun, but it's very important, too. Uh, it, it, similar to me, uh, I love the process of making uh, because I... Uh, especially when it's something that I don't know necessarily and I needed to learn a technique or something uh, or a new material, uh, same technique, new material that is going to impose uh, uh, constraints and I needed to understand what the constraints are. Uh, and that also takes me to ideas. And normally when I'm making something, I usually come up with uh, three more ideas. Uh, my, my biggest challenge is actually, uh, I, I, if I retire now, I don't know that I would uh, be able to do all the ideas I already have in my sketchbook, but uh, it's never ending. I always see things I want to do. Uh, so that part is just amazing. Uh, and I love to exhibit my work. I just love because it's when uh, the the you know, anyone from like a child or somebody with more experience, uh, uh, how they react differently to things or culturally speaking, uh, the differences between someone from one place to another place. I find that quite interesting, uh, which again, uh, uh, somehow reinforces to me that the environment that you grow and you get yourself exposed to is going to educate how you react with the uh, work in general. So uh, something I highly recommend to young people is to really expose uh, their, their ideas, their, their brain and, and to uh, and, uh, history, the history. Uh, uh, and uh, we have a wonderful library in the University of Iowa, the art building. So a place for inspiration and learning so attending shows uh, going to museums uh looking at old and new stuff and kind of making connections and understanding how that relates to what's going on in the world during that time so uh having a show it's really awesome thank you as someone else who also has an art practice i think all the time about those two things too it's like the making part and then the sharing part are both such exciting aspects of the work and one thing i think is really special about the way that both of you work is that you use um technologies different technologies as tools to help you execute things in your creative practice so talessa you mentioned you know four by five cameras and some other types of camera technology that you use. And Monica, you talked a little bit about the CNC process and milling and digital fabrication and, and 3D printing. So I was wondering if you could talk a little more about that technology piece in your work and how, um, how what kind of tools are they that you're using a little bit more, maybe helping us, some of us might be new to some of those terms, so helping us understand a little bit about what they are, and then maybe also what you enjoy about them, because they're pretty, um, they're pretty special and unique tools that you're using. You want to go first, Monica? <laughs> I can. Uh, well, sure. uh, uh, I use a lot of CNC, computer numerical control technology, which means uh, I'm designing uh, either with uh, AutoCAD software or 3D Studio Max software. There's there are like a huge amount of software out there that you can use that are kind of similar, but those are the two that I primarily work with. Uh, but uh, something I, I like also telling students is that uh, this younger generations are going to be require to know more and more and more about technology uh, and different pieces of software. 
So um, I had the students that were very sometimes uh, much younger than me, but uh, uh, like resisting this the fact that technology is, is becoming a big thing and a way for uh, you actually uh, uh, having a portfolio to go for job application. But anyway, that's a huge conversation. But yeah, I use, a, a, I design, I mean, I sketch normally freehand, uh, but not necessarily. Sometimes I sketch with computer modeling, which is a, a different process of sketching. Um, uh, and actually, when I teach, I make students go through both processes, which is uh, uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, then I use a, a 3D printing or rapid prototyping, which is a, a machine that uh, has a sort of a, an extrusion power of with plastic and deposit layer by layer and builds up uh, shapes through that process. And uh, we also have CNC. Uh, cutting, uh, which can be with a laser or a plasma machine, which means you transfer a drawing from AutoCAD to the machine and the machine cuts the shapes the, for you. Uh, or milling, which is instead of using AutoCAD would be uh, a, a modeling software and you have a shape and uh, the machine is able to carve out through milling uh, uh, three-dimensional shapes. And, depending on the machine, there's like three axes, four axes, five axes, uh, the machine can carve from different angles. Uh, so one important thing through the education is to understand what each process allows you to do uh, and really understanding that will allow you to uh, be fl flexible and versatile with materials uh, and, trying, and trying things that are unexpected. So, it's important that you understand that. So that's how I use technology. But I also use a lot of traditional because once the machine ends, I have to hand sand, I have to finish the, the wood, uh, whatever that is. I'm now currently working on a seating form that is, uh, I'm using felt. It's quite a large piece, so large that it doesn't go through a regular uh, door. Uh, and uh, upholstering is a, a, a completely different universe. So it's a collection of uh, things you learn, yeah. So interesting, Monica. I wanna come hang out in your world, your wing of the building a little bit more. Um, I mentioned there's a lot of te different technologies I work with. Um, I'll go through the ones that I mentioned. Um, I did want to mention really quickly, like, how do I decide what to use for each one? And I think the way Monica is speaking about it, you know, they offer different skill sets and there's also kind of maybe different conceptual reasons you might use one or another. Um, I kind of think of each project uh, married in its own kind of treatment of like, what kind of camera do I use? What does it mean to use video or audio? Um, and so that kind of shifts like, and I'm kind of, I'm, o I'm open to that. Um, that process. The first technology I mentioned was a four by five camera. Uh, these are actually, this is old technology um, uh, in the history of photography. So these are like, you picture those old timey cameras, it's a big box and you put the hood over your head and the size of the film itself is a four by five inch sheet of film. Um, it's an old technology, but at the same time, those cameras are, can and have capabilities that a lot of contemporary digital cameras simply cannot achieve. For example, you can achieve an infinite plane of focus. It's a little technical. We can go into that a separate time, but you can't do that with a digital camera. Um, part of it is because the focal uh, plane in the back can move. And so you can manipulate the planes of the camera and, uh, and, and play with space to achieve these kinds of effects. Um, and then the other technology I use a lot is audio and video. So I'm often taking field recordings when I'm out in the field. Um, uh, this was a skill set that I just learned as an undergraduate. I actually studied film and video um, and did installation work when I was an undergraduate. Um, but I also think as if, if any of you in the room are planning to pursue photography or certainly any other field, having a video skill set is really valuable. Whether you go into you know, wedding photography or you decide to pursue a, you know, academia and a professor job eventually, um, it rounds out your ability to kind of to think and, and be competitive in those spaces. 
I think for me, you know, photography has this magical ability to kind of freeze time um, and really like isolate moments to the point, as I mentioned, Susan Swantag's uh, quote, where they start to almost feel surreal. They're not quite uh, located in the in the in reality anymore. Um, for me, video has this time-based medium, right? You, if, if someone's experiencing your video, they have to kind of sit for a certain amount of time to experience the whole thing. And it's not something that can be contained in one moment. And so for me, there are different registers and they do different things. And uh, that's, that's why I like to play with them. It's a much longer conversation, kind of how do I decide what to do with which one? Um, but, you know, for that four by five, uh, camera, what I really liked is it slowed me down and it kind of brought me into the moment with Everard with the Gravedigger in a way that other technologies would kind of encourage a different kind of engagement, a different kind of treatment. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, we are supposed to be wrapping up here, but I think I can ask one more greedy question to fit it in before we finish, um, which is that we've had some wonderful questions in the chat. Thank you all so much for writing them. Uh, I apologize, we won't have time to get to everything, but there's two big concepts that I see that are coming out here that people are asking about. One is about conceptualizing work or coming up with that idea. Um, and then, so maybe if you could talk a little bit about, I think Monica, maybe you spoke to this a little bit, but how do those ideas, how does that idea phase of the project happen? And then there's also been some specific questions about the some of the subject matter you've each addressed and related to that concept, you know, something like um, how a project changes your relationship to a, a something hard, really hard to talk about for many of us like death or how it changes your relationship to nature. So if you wanted to answer that super hard question in um, just one to two minutes, I mean, we, can... we'll, we'll have that as our final question today. I can try. Uh, so how much do, uh, conceptualization? That's to me uh, important just because uh, uh, when I design a piece or a space, uh, I like to trigger questions in the viewer uh, and not be an obvious. So if it's inspired by a flower, for example, I don't want it to look like that flower. I want it to have uh, 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 the gesture, the movement, the, the outline, in such a way that it makes sort of a, a reference to. So, uh, and normally when I see something that I like, it, I immediately think of what that could be. Uh, and, and, and I have to sketch quickly because I can't forget that quickly as well. Uh, and how that changes uh, my relationship with nature. I just love nature uh, uh, more and more each day. That's, that's what it is. It's almost like I would be, I wanna go out there looking for more inspiration. <laughs> That, that there you go. Um, in regards to conceptualization, I mean, you you can probably tell with the grave digger, um, with Everard, I I met him and I I kind of became obsessed. I wanted to make a project about him. Um, but I also think you know part of why I'm an artist and that I work the way that I do is I'm just trying to process my place in the world as a human being. Um, as a community member, as you know, my friendships, my relationships, and and what I'm doing in life, and so I think you know, there's there's the fact that I met him and I thought he was interesting, but I also, for me, I was like processing my own grief at some point, and he became a really important figure in that process. Um, the way I'm working now is I kind of I actually have images that come to my head and I make them and I still can't quite verbalize why I'm doing it. I, I do a lot of writing on the side, a lot of free writing to help me figure out what kind of words I can put to this. Why am I making the images? Why am I drawn to this? So I, th those are very different ways of conceptualizing and working, but I think it's nice to welcome that sort of intuition at times and then kind of connect the dots later and trusting yourself that the kind of the heart of your idea, there's a reason why you're drawn to it. Um, yeah, and then someone asked, you know, you mentioned the like, how do our relationships change to the subject matter? And I think it's really real, especially for me, work, having worked on this project for so long, is I've, I've had moments that are really hard in this. And as I mentioned, my own grief and grieving, uh, there were times where I felt like Everard was really the only person who understood this or who could kind of sit comfortably with the subject matter. Um, but my own relationship to the work has has changed over the years, my own comfort with the, the subject matter. Um, I've learned so much from spending time with him and also learned a lot about art and art making from spending time with him. And so I think, 
you know, maybe that goes hand in hand with the idea of intuition or process is that if you're open to the idea that things change and shift um, and that that's something to learn from, it's not something to, to get nervous about that, that there are moments that will just surprise you. And um, yeah, and you can kind of fold that into the process and embrace it. Well, thank you both again so, so much for sharing your work with us. And congratulations again to all of you who won Scholastic Art Awards, um, who applied to them. It's a really big deal to just apply to things like that. And you should be really proud of yourself for that. And also all your teachers and family members and parents for supporting you in this early phase in your art career. It's a really big deal. And as you can probably tell from Talasa and Monica, it's also a really fun place to get to be and work and do things. So congratulations to you all. Uh, I think we have a couple of minutes here before the next art session starts at two. Josh, any other closing yes. words? Um, nope, I just want to say thanks to our three presenters, to Allison, Monica, and Thalassa. Um, it was a fascinating talk. Um, really interesting to hear about your work. And um, thank you all for uh, coming and presenting. So um, just want to say thanks also and congratulations to the students. Um, and if you're interested, the Bell and Blank Center has a couple of um, summer um, uh, programs going on. Um, the Bell and Blank um, summer art residency and the Bell and Blank summer art uh, writing residency. And you can learn uh, a little bit more about those on our website. So um, thanks again. Um, we will be back. I think I'm going to pop out to the waiting room um, to meet our next round of presenters. Um, I think you should all be able to stay. If you want to stay on for the next art session, you can just stay in this room um, and you'll see the next presenters come in. Um, but yeah, take a few minutes stretch and um, we'll see you in a few. Thanks again.